Well, good evening and welcome to another production of Sephir Academy. I'm Dr. Stephen Pigeon. Today is July 7th, 2022, an interesting day in the neighborhood to say the least. I'm so glad that you're here to join me tonight for tonight's production. Coming to you from an undisclosed location in the wilds of Alaska. And uh, just, I'm so happy to be here and to discuss this topic we have for tonight. You know, recently a tablet was found at the site of Joshua's altar on Mount Ebal, near the Palestinian city of Nablus, formerly called Shechem. The tablet was named the Curse Tablet as it contained the word cursed 10 times. This is a significant sign of the times given to mankind such a time as this by the hand of Yahweh himself, foretelling of the judgment to come. Yet the house of Babylon neither sees nor hears anything on the horizon. As it was yesterday, they tell themselves, so again it will be today. Yet the ten curses rise and the stirring of judgment manifests among mankind. Judgment has already been rendered. The development of the curses have simply not yet appeared, for great destruction is coming now on the wicked. This is not the working of man, but the judgment of the Most High, El Elyon, who uses even sinners to accomplish his work on this earth. It is the time to look at the prophecy concerning the curses. For those who have eyes which seeing can understand and ears which when hearing do perceive the truth that is before us now. Judgment has been rendered, and now the curses follow. Have ye come out of her yet? Well, this is the question, is it not? And so as we see this tonight, we're going to take a look at this. And, you know, I, I have to tell you that I'm going to kind of give you a little background on the inspiration for all of this. You know, as I looked at what was happening in the world, it just occurred to me that we're, we're seeing some incredible things from some incredibly wicked people, people who have misled the whole world. They have lied in order to obtain their political positions. And in their positions of power, they have waged war on the very people that have put them in power. They've waged war on their own people. They've attacked their own people and, and persecuted their own people. And, and they think of their own people as deplorables, you know, is Islamophobes, homophobes, misogynists, bigots, you know, uh, infantile morons, uh, uh, dead sheep, useless eaters is one of the phrases that is banded around quite a bit. Useless eaters, the people that put them in their positions of authority, they call useless eaters. Well, this kind of thing uh, is, okay, it's, you know, it's one perspective, it's an opinion, but to be so arrogant and so elite that you, you believe you can condescend and con condemn those who are responsible for you being in your position of authority is really when you know you have lost touch with all things that matter to anyone, anywhere. And where's the sense of decency that comes with these people? Where is the sense of decency? Well, you know, we're just going to go ahead and cut off your food. We're going to go ahead and cut off your electricity. We're going to cut off your heat. We're going to cut off this. We're going to cut off that while we stage a pandemic that um, the cure is worse than the disease. And we're going to mandate the cure while we force you into a submission into absolutely worthless protocols that mean nothing, such as wearing a mask or being in a lockdown, or social distancing, such absurd words and absurd notions and absurd ideas all of which have been proven by peer-reviewed scientists as completely fruitless and futile. They should have never been done. Yet the exercise to push forward this pandemic protocol brought about a catastrophic failure of the global economy they were so desperately trying to create, a new world order sabotaged by themselves and their own egomaniacal desires and their self-pontification and magnification into this world, that they have destroyed the very auspices upon which they stand. And they continue to move forward. Now, let's just speak briefly about what the future holds that we can see on the horizon. For instance, we know that in roughly five days, 100% of Russian natural gas is going to be cut off from Western Europe. There will be no purchasing it at all. The Nord Stream pipeline is going to be closed. 
The Yamal pipeline, which comes to Belarus and Ukraine, is already closed. And the Russians have announced they will not sell any of their commodities to, quote unquote, unfriendly nations at any price. For the nations that are friendly, they're expected to pay in rubles. Well, this is, going, is an interesting quandary. It's already resulted in a substantial downturn and a devaluation of the euro worldwide because the kind of pressure that is now being placed upon the European theater is enormous. It is enormous. There's expectation that anywhere from 40 to 50% of German industry will fail this winter. Not to mention those homes that are gonna go unheated. There's already discussions of rationing hot water and rationing heat throughout the Nordic and the um, Central European nations that do experience a, a serious winter. And these kinds of things are ferocious, and it's not going to get better. And in fact, if the Russians who have this weapon in their arsenal, if they should decide to reduce their oil production by 5 million barrels a month, which is perfectly possible to them, if they were to do so, the expectation by JP Morgan and by other analysts in the United States is that oil would reach up to $380 per barrel which would put the gas prices in the United States is between 20 and $25 a gallon, and in Europe between 30 and $40 a gallon. Obviously, no one's gonna be going anywhere because who can afford to pay that when you're talking about five, six, $700 a fill up? Hmm, that's a bit steep. And as you can imagine, when you're talking about, well, how about commuters that need to commute to their job? They can't commute to their job because all of the money they're making in commuting is going into the gas tank. There's no money for them to eat. And of course, food is another thing that is coming in short supply. Why? Because the fertilizer that has been routinely exported out of Russia is no longer available. And inordinate weather throughout the Western world, serious drought, and in, and in contrast to the serious drought, floods, inordinate flooding, flash flooding, and catastrophic flooding in places that haven't seen floods in a long time. We saw some recent weather in South Dakota, for instance, where the whole sky turned green, green for heaven's sakes. Massive hailstorms coming in of inordinate warming, causing fruit trees and so forth to begin to bud, only to be frozen again and killing off the crop for the year. Drought throughout a good percentage of the United States. And of course, the water is drying up in the Western United States. The Colorado River is a trickle. Lake Mead is now so low that they're talking, they have closed the Hoover Dam. The Hoover Dam is not functioning at all. There's no water to put it through the Hoover Dam. And Lake Mead is uh, at the lowest it's ever been. In fact, they're discovering all those bodies that disappeared out of Las Vegas all those years ago. They're now finding them in all kinds of vehicles and so forth at what used to be under 185 feet of water. Now, in addition to that, Lake Powell is drying up. Lake Shasta is drying up. Oroville Dam, which used to have a lake behind it, now has a river behind it instead. And you're seeing even the Great Salt Lake is just about completely gone in Utah, the Great Salt Lake in Utah. It's almost completely gone. Well, this is very interesting that we have all of a sudden these droughts coming on. We have these pandemics coming on. We have these new diseases that are being uh, found like monkeypox. And, uh, and, so, and there's all this announcement by the same pharmaceuticals that waged war against us for the last two years, planning another counterattack here this coming fall, where they're talking about new lockdowns, new protocols, new viruses, whatever it is they can do to drive their profits back up. So with all of that happening, you can see that we have pestilence, we have plague, we have famine, we have drought, we have the drying up of the waters, we have the potential for massive war. And the potential for massive war remains on the horizon. And, you know, I mean, there's some interesting things on the war front. I'll just share them with you very quickly. We have a situation going on now where Russia, China, Iran, Venezuela, and other Latin American nations are going to be participating in a very large war game effort in the Caribbean off the southern coast of the United States. Now, this is going to go on in the time when under the current president of the United States, one of the most incompetent men who's ever been in the office ever in the history of the country has taken you know, much of our field munitions and our field uh, artillery 
and our field weapons and has shipped them off to Ukraine to either be summarily destroyed by the Russians or sold on the black market in Serbia. In either event, we don't have them here. This is after he gave away $94 billion worth of assets and the most advanced air base in the world in his fleeing, uh, fleeing like a true abject coward from the nation of Afghanistan and leaving not only all of this $94 billion worth of equipment behind, but Americans and American allies in Afghanistan behind. Really an enormous, an enormous and pathetic display of complete incompetence. And now we're facing this war game coming up in August off our southern border. And in the meantime, our military is preparing by having drag shows in Andrews Air Force Base as their top topic. So we have, we've got some very serious morale issues, equipment issues, supply issues, industrial issues, manufacturing issues, economic issues, transportation in, uh, issues, and so forth, energy issues. All of these things are in now becoming acute and in crisis level. And all of things, these things have happened, really, and have accelerated in the last two years, the last year and a half, the last two years. This is what we have seen. Well, there's a reason for this. And part of the reason for this has to do with the fact that the wicked are cursed. Now, they don't want to hear it, but I'm going to say it here. The wicked are cursed. And you're going to discover, you, know, you wicked who are watching this, why you are cursed. It's because of what is in your mind and what is in your heart. And that's why things are falling apart at the tip of your fingers, because you are cursed. And you are cursed not by some witch, not by some Satanist, not by somebody who's out there casting spells. No, you are cursed by Yahweh himself, the maker of heaven and earth who has said, because of what you have done, these curses will come upon you. And so I want to make it very clear. Now, you can see that the hand of Yah is beginning to move, and we're starting to see some very significant turning points. One turning point, for instance, has to do with the elimination of Boris Johnson in the UK, who has been forced to step down as the prime minister. Of course, this happened to Benjamin Netanyahu before him in Israel. Israel has no government currently. They can't form a government. In the United States, we have a problem where the regime of Biden is the most incredibly uh, uncredible uh, organizations in American history. I mean, he has an approval rating that's hovering around 12%. He claims he was elected by 80 million voters, at least 38 million of which were unregistered and didn't exist in the voter database. But that goes without saying. At any rate, the, but by the Biden regime is a very, very unpopular regime. 87% of Americans believing that America is on the wrong course, on the wrong course. And again, this has to do with the fact that Biden and his minions and all of those who are in the elite upper echelons of authority in the United States are cursed individuals. They don't know they're cursed. But I'm going to tell them they're, they're cursed. And because they're cursed, they have a very bad destiny in this world and an even worse one in the world to come. So with that, all that being said, let's take a look and see if we can bring up our PowerPoint here. And let's take a look at tonight's production. Okay, let's see. Boom. There we go. Okay. So a production of Sefer Academy. And remember that all citations here are done from the Sefer Millennium Edition, and which is available at sefer.net, sefer.net. And these instructions are also available through Sefer Academy at seferacademy.net. And I want to thank you guys for supporting Sefer. You know, our team at Sefer, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, experiencing some of the downturns of the current economic downturn. As a result, we've had Many of our employees uh, have been uh, rolled back or taken rollbacks. And so it's kind of a big deal. And so your support for the Sefer Publishing Group is greatly appreciated. I just want to let you know that. And we're very, very happy with, with, um, with what, you, what you all have done. We're very pleased by the hand of God, how he has blessed our company. May his name be forever praised in our life now and forevermore. By his name, it is that we rise. By his hand, it is that we work. And may his blessing come upon this particular 
discussion tonight. And may you all who are participating in, in this discussion be equally blessed and cared for. May his wings cover over you and carry you through what is to come. All right, let's take a look at the fall of the house of Babylon. Cursed, cursed, cursed. Cursed by Yahweh Elohim. You will die cursed. Cursed, you will surely die. Cursed by Yahweh. Cursed, cursed, cursed. This is the language of what was found on the cursed tablet at Mount Ebal in Nablus, Israel, this year, about a month ago. This was in, Nablus, by the way, is in uh, what's called the, the um, West Bank. And this is in the northern part of the West Bank, or Samaria. And Nablus is the, uh, uh, is the largest city there in the West Bank, in the, uh, the northern uh, West Bank. And uh, it used to be, there, the original town there was Shechem. And at Shechem is where you found, is where you can find, even today, the tomb of Joseph and the well of Yaakov. And remember, the woman at the well, the first one, to receive Mashiach and the first one to receive salvation through Mashiach was found at this well, the well of Yaakov in Samaria, in Shechem. Well, there are two mountains there. There's Mount Gerizim and there's Mount Ebal. And Mount Gerizim was the Mount of Blessing and Mount Ebal was the Mount of Cursing. And when they came into the land, they were instructed half the tribes to stand on the Mount of Blessing and proclaim blessing and half the tribes to stand on Mount Ebal and to proclaim cursing. And this particular tablet was found on Mount Ebal, the Mount of Cursing, laying out this curse, pretty explicit, right? This is a tenfold curse found at Joshua's altar on Mount Ebal. So cursed one, cursed two, cursed three, that's three times. Cursed four by Yahweh, that's four. You will die cursed, that's five. Cursed six, you will surely die cursed seven by Yahweh. Cursed eight, cursed nine, cursed ten. Tenfold cursing. That was found. Now, this was found, and what's going on here? All of a sudden, we have this find. Gee, hold on here. I've got a rogue mustache here. Here, that's giving me grief. This is something very significant that we would find this tenfold cursing tablet from ancient history at Joshua's altar at this time, because this time is bringing forward this idea of a tenfold curse. Now, I want to make it clear, those who are cursed, this cursing is being very specifically stated here. You will die cursed. Cursed, you will surely die. Now, this is a Hebraic uh, uh, antonym, if you will, where you say it this way, you will die cursed, cursed, you will die. Boom, boom. We come in, then we go out. You know, two, uh, well, two arrows doing this, right? You, so you see that this is, and then by Yahweh, Cursed, cursed, cursed. It opens up, cursed, 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 and it ends, cursed, cursed, cursed. So this is telling you something. It's very explicit. And it's come now at this time when mankind has fallen away from all of the things that Yahweh has tried to teach, from the written scriptural word, from the premises that we have a creator and that our creator loves us, cares for us, created us with the intent that we would find him anew. In this world where we are behind the veil, blessed are those who believe without seeing, that we would find him anew in this world behind the veil. But we're behind the veil for one reason, because we elected free will. And because we elected free will, okay, you're going to have to find Yah by yourself. You're going to have to freely elect Yah. No one's going to give it to you. And to freely elect it is going to have to be something that truth in your heart. So in Deuteronomy 11, 29, it reads, And it shall come to pass when Yahweh Eloheka has brought you into the land, whether you go to possess it, that you shall put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. All right. So let's review those curses. But before we do, let's review to whom those curses apply. So if you're wondering, hey, am I part of the cursed group? Well, let's see. It shall come to pass if you will not hearken unto the voice of Yahweh Eloheka to guard, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, 
that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. So the curses apply to those who will not hearken to the voice of Yahweh Eloheka, will not do all of his commandments, and will not do all of his statutes. Well, look, all that stuff got nailed to the cross. I don't have to do that stuff. I'm out of here. I've got Christian liberty to do whatever I want to do. So get out of here with your legalism, Dr. P. Well, let's see what how it's laid out for us in Deuteronomy 28, what this means for the lawless. One moment. One can be lawless. One should not be lawless without a cup of coffee. This is my daughter's coffee cup. World's best mom. Yes. Take that coffee cup. I don't know. She'd have to compete with my wife. Cursed shall ye be in the city, and cursed shall ye be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your store. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the fruit of your land, the increase of your kind and the flocks of your sheep. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. Yahweh shall send upon you cursing. Well, that's just what happened. The cursing was found, and Yahweh sent it. The tenfold cursing of Joshua's mountain was found, and Yahweh sent it. Yahweh shall send upon you cursing, vexation, and rebuke in all that you set your hand unto for to do, until you be destroyed, and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings, whereby you have forsaken me. So this is a question you have to ask yourself. Has our political leadership at the federal level forsaken Yah? That's a question. Has our political leadership at the state level forsaken Yah? Another question. Has our political leadership in the counties forsaken Yah? In your county, have they forsaken Yah? In your city, have they forsaken Yah? How about in your school district? Have they forsaken Yah? How about in your school? Have they forsaken Yah? If they have, then they are wicked. And if they're wicked, then this is the cursing that's going to come upon them. Cursed shall you be in the city. Well, how bad is it in the city? Well, you ought to take a look at the list of the, those cities that are completely running out of water. The water is about to totally disappear. It's going to be gone. You turn on the tap, nothing. You flush the toilet, nothing. Turn on the shower, nothing. Try to run your washing machine, nothing. Zero, zip. Not even brown stuff with the dirt, nothing. Zip. When that happens, what do you do? Can you stay there? How long can you stay there? How long can you stay there? A day, two, a week? How long can you stay in an environment with 10 million people who have no water? Or 20 million people? I mean, we're talking cities like Mexico City, Tokyo, Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, Las Vegas, uh, even Phoenix, running out of water. The water is going away. And how about in the field? Well, let's talk about the field, right? How do you feel about drought? How do you feel about trees bringing up their bud because of inordinate and early heat in the spring, only to have a frost freeze and snowfall come down and forced to sap back into the tree, thereby terminating the ability of that tree to produce fruit for the year, or hailstones coming down and crushing the early crops that are growing in the fields in South North Dakota, or drought where there's no water like we have going on in Texas and in Oklahoma, and Arizona, and Mexico, Colorado, California, and Oregon, or how about locusts that are all over Oregon and Washington that are swarming? Are they cursed in the field? That's a question. Are they cursed in the field? Cursed shall be your basket and your store. Well, let's take a look at your store. Now, your store might be Walmart, right? Your basket might be Walmart, and your store might be Walmart. You know, A&P, All News Pipeline, Susan Duclos and company, they have, they've run a continuous stream of articles about bare shelves all over the United States. You know, for some of you, you ran out of feminine hygiene products and baby formula a long time ago. That's not the only shortage, right? There's all kinds of shortages, and those shortages are expected to grow exponentially. Why? Because the fruit of the increase of our kind and the flocks of our sheep, including the fruit of chickens and turkeys and other farm animals, have been slaughtered 
over and over again because somebody came up with the great idea of giving a chicken a PCR test, right? The most notoriously inaccurate test there is, oh, gee, your chicken's got COVID. Hmm. Slaughtered all 19 million of them because one chicken gave a false positive on a PCR test. Well, guess what? The increase of the kind is being directly affected, the food supply being directly affected. Over 20 main food processing houses in the United States have inordinately burned to the ground in the last three months. Hmm, strange. And the ones that didn't burn the ground were told to shut down and they have. Now we see trucking is coming to a complete halt. Those of you who are familiar with DEF, D-E-F, this is a urea-driven uh, exhaust formula for diesel motors that your diesel engine will not perform without. Well, the DEF is completely running away and it's gonna be completely gone here in about another 14 days. That's it for trucking. Trucking has been severely curtailed by administrative regulations in California. So if you're not getting your food out of some other port besides Long Beach, you're not gonna get it. Okay, so you can see that the city is being cursed, the field is being cursed, the basket is being cursed, the store is being cursed, the fruit of the body is being cursed, the fruit of the land is being cursed, the increase of the kind is being cursed, and the flocks of sheep are being cursed. Cursed shall you be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. It's not going to get better if you leave. It's not going to get better. It's the same wherever you go because Yahweh shall send upon you cursing, vexation, rebuke in all 100% of everything you set your hand to do until you are destroyed and you perish quickly because of your wickedness because you have forsaken Yah. Now, you might think to yourself, you know, Dr. P, you're just, you know, blowing a lot of hot wind because that just doesn't apply to me and because I'm not wicked, number one. And number two, that stuff is just fairy tale stuff. That comes from the fairy tale mythology of that scripture stuff that you people want to read and you want to hang on to and believe. You want to cling to your Bibles and your guns, as Barack Obama said. You want to cling to that fairy tale stuff. That fairy tale stuff doesn't apply to us. No, you know what applies to you? Monkeypox applies to you. Since you think this is a big fairy tale, then monkeypox pox can apply to you. Okay, now let's continue on these curses. Yahweh shall make the pestilence cleave unto you. The pestilence. Oh, well, wait a minute. What do you mean the pestilence? Oh, yeah, guess what? Check out who's getting the monkeypox, right? Those people who have had a little bit too much celebrating over the gay pride parade. Right. Because that's what happened in New York City 10 days after the gay pride parade. The number of monkeypox cases doubled and the CDC readily admits that it is homosexual practice that is causing the rise in monkeypox. The CDC admits that. And in fact, it's well known in the U UK and the rest of Europe as well. And guess what? The pestilence is cleaving under you and it's going to continue to cleave unto you until Yahweh has consumed you from off the land from where you go to possess it. So you might be an immigrant, a second generation immigrant, or even a 10th generation immigrant to the United States of America, but you came to this land, to possess this land it, under the blessing of Yah, and he's going to consume you off of it. He's going to consume you off of it because of your wickedness. Yahweh shall smite you with consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation and with an extreme burning. Oh, yeah, all of that stuff. And with the sword, and with blasting, and with mildew. And there, all these things are going to continue to pursue you until they get you. It says right there, they shall pursue you until you perish. And your heaven that is over your head shall be brass. Is there any air conditioning around here? No, we don't have air conditioning anymore because the electric grid shut down. Why did the electric grid shut down? Well, because number one, a third of the electric grid is run on diesel generators and there's no death and, de and we can't afford the diesel. The other generators run on natural gas. We can't get that either. And the nuclear power plant, well, that one melted down a long time ago. So we had to shut it down. Oh, OK. So how are we doing with electricity? Well, what electricity is left, we've already rationed for the Teslas that are owned by the political elite. They get to use that electricity, not you and your air conditioner. So you get out there under the sun, which is going to be a head of brass, and the earth under you shall be iron, hot, dry, dried up, hard, and hot. And you're not getting any air conditioning. Yahweh shall make the rain of your land powder. 
and dust. Just blow it away. Powder and dust from heaven it shall come down upon you until you are destroyed. Okay, so I, I guess there's no like mitigating this curse. Once this curse happens, is there a stopping point? Answer, no. There's no stopping point. No. No stopping point. The curse comes underway and there's no stopping point. It keeps going until you perish, until you are consumed, until you are destroyed, until there ain't nothing left. There's another way of putting it. Yahweh shall cause you to be smitten before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee in seven ways before them. It was kind of like that pride parade in, in Central Park. Somebody touched off some fireworks and everybody panicked. Oh, they're shooting at us. And that was the end of the pride parade. Of course, then we have a transgendered guy show up at the 4th of July works and start shooting up the place. And he wasn't kidding with fireworks. He was going for the gusto, right? You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. Bye. You know, if you want to see how that works, ask Ukrainian refugees. They're in all the kingdoms of the earth now. And your carcass shall be meat unto all fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth, and no man shall fray them away. In other words, when you die, you're just going to be out there in the field like dumb. There isn't going to be anybody there to bury you or otherwise take care of your carcass. Instead, as uh, Josie Wales once said, you know, the buzzard's got to eat too, just like the worm. Okay. Let's continue on. Yahweh will smite you with the botch of Mitzrayim and with the tumors and with the scab and with the itch, whereof you cannot be healed. Well, have we seen that? Oh, yeah, we have. We've seen it. You've seen many, many pictures of it. I know you have. You, you guys who watch the uh, inside sources on the net effects of the snake bite, how many people have come down with tumors and with scabs and with the itch that cannot be healed? Yahweh shall smite you with madness. Oh, yeah. And blindness and astonishment of heart. All of this is also happening with neurological disorders that are approximately related to the snake bite. And you shall grope at noonday as the blind gropes in darkness, and you shall not prosper in your ways, and you shall be only oppressed and spoiled evermore. In other, in other words, once this curse comes upon you, all that's coming to you from here on out is oppression and being spoiled evermore, and nobody, nobody, but nobody there to save you. How about this one? You shall betroth a woman, and another man shall lie with her. You shall build a house. But you won't dwell in it. You shall plant a vineyard, and you shall not gather the grapes. Your ox shall be slain before your eyes. You shall not eat thereof. Your ass shall be violently taken away from before your face and shall not be restored to you. And your sheep shall be given to your enemies, and you shall have none to rescue them. What happened to my stuff? Gone. Gone. Your sons and your daughters shall be given unto another people. And your eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long. And there shall be no might in your hand. So weak from what you see. The fruit of your land and all of your labor shall a nation which you know not eat up. And you shall be only oppressed and crushed always. So that you should be mad for the sight of your eyes which you shall see. Yahweh shall smite you in the knees and in the legs with a sore botch that cannot be healed. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head. Yahweh shall bring you and your king, which you shall set over you unto a nation, which neither you nor your fathers have known. And there you shall serve other Elohim, which are made of wood and stone. Oh, well, that doesn't sound good. And you shall become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations where the Yahweh shall lead you. You shall carry much seed out into the field and shall gather little in. For the locust shall consume it. You shall plant vineyards and dress them, but neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. You shall have olive trees throughout all your coasts, but you shall not anoint yourself with oil, for your olive shall cast his fruit. You shall beget sons and daughters, but you shall not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. All of your trees and fruits of your land shall the locust consume. 
Now, we're already seeing signs of this right now. They're having a big locust swarm on the West Coast right now. The stranger that is within you shall get up above you very high, and you shall come down very low. He shall lend to you, and you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head, you shall be the tail. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and shall pursue you and overtake you to till you be destroyed. They're not going to let up. They're going to keep going. Because you hearken not unto the voice of Yahweh Eloheka to guard his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded you. And they shall be upon you for a sign and a wonder and upon your seed forever, because you serve not Yahweh Eloheka with joyfulness and gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Mm. Yes. Yah will provide to us the abundance of all things, and we can live in joyfulness and gladness of heart, rather than to be living under these curses, because we have forsaken his way. Now, have we arrived at this point in the United States or in the Western world? No, not quite, but we are dangerously close. The drought has overtaken America and its farmland. The water for the cities is drying up. The pestilence is being unleashed by our own leaders. The locusts are already present. The stranger is within and is succeeding. The instruction of our youth is falling into decay. While information increases, intelligence is falling. Decadence, degradation, defilement, and demoralization are now in America. Okay, so I'm going to take a second to talk about that for a second, because I think it's worth talking about. I'm going to say, you know, conservatively speaking, we have not arrived at the fullness of these curses, okay? But the curses are on the horizon. They're here, they're present, they're lurking, and they're preparing to move forward. Now, we have many things that are out there that you can see. You can see, for instance, a hyperinflation now that is going to devalue the currency you currently have in your bank, in your 401k, in your savings account, in your pocket, in your wallet, wherever you may have any currency at all. Every second that we talk here on this program tonight, it's being devalued. It's being devalued because of a robust inflation caused by our leaders who believe they could print money out of thin air. And in fact, the head of the Federal Reserve admitted that they miscalculated how much money they could print. That was miscalculation number one. Miscalculation number two was this idea of Joe Biden putting economic sanctions on Russia, who is the largest provider of oil and natural gas in the world, the largest provider of fertilizer in the world, and holds a near monopoly on things like nickel, cadmium, and lithium, as well as ammonium nitrate. And so as a consequence, what do we see? We see that economically now we're facing absolute catastrophe. Now, I'm going to try to be clear about this so that people who are watching this maybe around the world can see. We're talking economic catastrophe. The catastrophe that's coming to Europe is going to be an unprecedented uh, catastrophe, more significant and more harsh than the Great Depression of the 1920s that overtook the Weimar Republic in Germany, where they had robust, rampant hyperinflation and a totally collapsed and destroyed economic base. This one's gonna be worse than that. This one's gonna be worse than that in France, in Italy, in Spain, in Portugal, in Greece, throughout Western Europe, the Netherlands, and in the UK. Now, many of you who are in those places have already seen the net result of this. The net result so far is you're paying practically $12 a gallon for a gallon of gas in, in uh, the UK. Your heating bills have tripled. Your electric bills have tripled and your food prices have doubled. But the food prices are going to shoot, absolutely shoot through the roof this fall. And they're going to be subject to rationing, as is fuel, as is heat, as is hot water, as is electricity going to be subject to rationing. All of this is a self-inflicted gunshot head to the gunshot to the head inflicted by the Biden administration in its economic wisdom, which is not very wise at all, if you ask me, and if you, and if you see what's actually going on. So what we're talking about now with the forecast is, first of all, all of your major forecasters have said, 
we have been in two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. That, by definition, is recession. They're predicting an economic growth of exactly zero in the third quarter. When we hit a fourth quarter of no growth, that is a depression, by definition. Four quarters of negative growth equals an economic depression. In this depression, we're going to see a number of things happen. One, the United States currency will ultimately fail. Right now, it's the euro that's failing. It's the pound that's failing. It is the Swiss franc that's failing. These currencies are, are under extreme pressure. And the reason they're under extreme pressure is because the analysts in Europe know that Europe is subject to a complete economic collapse that appears irreversible. And every day that goes on, you have people who are all testosterone and no intellect considering how they can escalate an even greater tension with Russia. So the G7 met and said, we want to put sanctions on the price of Russian oil in order to quote unquote, starve out Russia. Well, I don't know how you feel about it, but it strikes me if my neighbor, if I overheard my neighbor's conversation say, I got to figure out a way to starve out my neighbor, I would be making plans as to why he's not going to get away with doing that. Well, this is exactly what the Russians are doing. And the Russians have said, oh, you're going to starve us out? Well, then great. We're not selling anything to you at any price. So now you have Western Europe in a situation where between 40 and 60% of its natural gas is gone, not going to be available. And Israel is saying, well, we can make it up with our Israeli fuel. Well, you're going to have to get that stuff to market and you're going to be shipping it out of a war zone. You will be shipping it out of a war zone. And that war zone, by the way, is getting hotter and hotter and hotter by the second. You have Turkey, which has made rapid inroads into the nation of Syria with invasion forces. The Russians have said, that's intolerable. We're not going to allow you to invade Syria. The Russian goal is to reestablish the original integrity boundaries of Syria. And that is going to be at the expense of Turkey, at the expense of Iraq, at the expense of the Kurds, at the expense of the Lebanese, and at the expense of the Israelis. The Israelis have been moving constantly against Iranian assets inside of Syria. Iran is deploying substantially greater levels of assets into the field and is creating a, a huge salvo of munitions that they are prepared to launch on the nation of Israel. In the meantime, you have Turkey, Iran, Russia, Syria, all eyeballing the Israeli gas and the Israeli gas platforms. Hmm. Well, let's see. One bomb under the single Israeli gas platform, how much gas comes out of Israel? Well, that's a good question. But we do know this, that the natural gas from the Nord Stream pipeline in Europe is going to be closed in five days permanently. And the Yamal gas pipeline has already been shut off. And the amount of gas coming into Western Europe is going to be zero. Right now it's July. When it gets to October, it's going to be a big question for those governments in those European countries who have been making these decisions. Now, here comes this squeaky pipsqueak in Lithuania who decides, well, we're going to go ahead and shut off the Suwalki Corridor and otherwise besiege Russian territory in Kaliningrad. Now, why Western Europe would allow this pipsqueak to start World War III is beyond me, but they allowed the pips week in Ukraine to start World War III. So why not allow this loudmouth of Lithuania to do the same thing? The Russians are not going to tolerate, tolerate the closure of the Suwalki Corridor. And as a result, that could have the, the potential of expanding into a rapid World War III scenario, including a nuclear World War III scenario. The only thing preventing that scenario right now is the fact that the West is killing itself faster than Russian nuclear weapons. So when you look at the situation, I'm just going to speak to European leaders. If you do not change the course you're on, then you might as well publish right now your official statement as let them eat cake, because that's what you're saying to the people of your nation that put you in power. You people can eat cake. I'm too busy serving BlackRock. I'm too busy serving the Biden administration. I'm too busy taking orders from NATO. Well, if you're so busy in your alliance to America, to BlackRock, to NATO, and to the AI god that's running all this machine, then go and visit them and bow down to that. But bear in mind that you're saying to your people, you people can eat cake, just as Marie Antoinette did. 
Okay, now that's the situation that's happening in Europe. And you're not going to be able to get away with it much longer. We're talking about you've got about 45 days before all of this stuff is going to implode on your head like a massive house of cards is going to come down and just take everything down. And Europe is going to fall into a depression that is going to be something like 70 years coming out of it. It's going to be a massive, massive, massive downturn in Europe, equivalent to what the bubonic plague did. So I want you guys to think about that in European quarters. In the meantime, in the United States and Canada and in New Zealand and in Australia, the people have are absolutely up to the brim with grim. They have had enough of this ridiculous World Economic Forum leadership. And if the leaders do not reform themselves, they're going to be replaced. They're going to be replaced. All right, let's continue on and let's see what scripture has to say about this equation. All right. Okay, our leaders, however, are without an excuse. They can sit here and claim, oh, well, I had a good idea. No, you didn't. You know, like Joe Biden coming out and saying, oh, this is Putin's tax increase on the gas pump. Well, Putin didn't sanction Russian gas and oil. You did. He didn't stop delivering it. You refused to allow him to deliver it. They didn't default on their loans. You refused to take their money. They didn't stop well, selling wheat to the West. You have refused to allow anybody in the West to buy it. So don't talk about Putin's tax increase, Joe. You did it. You did it, and everyone knows it. That's why your disapproval rating is at 87%, because everybody in the world knows you did it. You did it. And now we're not believing that you did it out of dementia. We're believing you did it intentionally because you think of us as deplorable. You're without an excuse, Joe. For the wrath of Elohim is revealed from heaven against all wickedness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of Elohim is manifest in them. For Elohim has showed it unto them. For from the creation of the world, the invisible things of Yah are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and divinity so that they are without excuse. Don't try to pass the buck. You don't have an excuse. You don't have an excuse. You don't have an excuse. You did it. You guys seized the reins of authority because you thought you could run the world better than everybody else. You had your green agenda and your global warming and all of the rest of this nonsense. And look what you've done. Look what you've done to my song. Ma, look what you've done to this country. Look what you've done. Because that, when they knew Elohim, they glorified him not as Elohim, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Oh, I'm the cat's meal. I'm going to build back better. And their foolish heart was darkened. Darkened professing themselves to be wise, they became fools because a fool says there is no Elohim. Therefore, they're fools. Axiomatic premise proved and changed the glory of the incorruptible Elohim into an image made like corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things like snakes, like Asclepius, like Cadesis. Yeah. And even as they did not like to retain Elohim in their knowledge, Elohim gave them over to a reprobate mind. Hello, here it comes to do at those things which are not convenient, being filled with all kinds of unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, being full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of Elohim, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, boom, covenant breakers. Is there a covenant that you guys haven't broken? Is there any single covenant in your life you haven't broken? You pathological liars. Is there any covenant you haven't broken? Without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who 
knowing the judgment of Elohim. And in case you didn't know it, I'm telling it to you tonight. In case you didn't know what the judgment of Elohim is, I'm telling it to you tonight. That they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Oh, we like this stuff. We like this wickedness. We like this degradation. We like this demoralization. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We like this destruction stuff. We're making money on this. Are you kidding me? Pride? Oh, let's have a pride month and a pride parade. And let's have some pride stuff going around. Okay. Well, let's take a look at pride for a minute. And let's see how that plays in the eyes of Yah. But if ye will not hearken unto me and will not do at all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, that but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning ag that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and you shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when none pursues you. Ah, we've heard that. That's twice we've heard that. And if ye will not yet for all of this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Okay, so, you know, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get you guys to smell the smelling salts here. You need to turn from your wickedness. If you're not going to turn from your wickedness, at least have enough decency left in your brain somewhere. Some speck of decency that used to exist when you were a child. You had some decency there. There's still a speck of that somewhere. See if you can find that speck. And when you find it, You'll do the right thing and resign your position and give your authority over to someone who is at least seeking righteousness because it ain't you. And I will set my face against you. You shall be slain before your enemies. They, shall, they that hate you shall reign over you and you shall flee when none pursues you. And if you will, will not yet for all of this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sin. Here comes seven times more. You thought you had it bad now? Seven times more. And I will break the pride of your power. Now that's coming. The pride of your power is about to be completely shattered, broken, and totally destroyed. I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass and your strength shall be spent in vain for your land shall not yield her increase. Neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. Pride. And if you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. Oh, so you're trying to tell me we're going to do this lockdown pandemic thing seven times? I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. And if you will not be reformed by me by these things, but continue to walk contrary unto me, then I will also walk contrary unto you. You want to walk contrary unto me? Okay, go for it then I'm going to walk contrary unto you. Try to figure that out. You want to walk away from Yah. You want to condemn him. You want to call him a fairy tale. You want to denounce him. You want to defame him. You want to desecrate him. You want to destroy those things sacred. You want to criminalize him. You want to make him unlawful. You walk contrary to him, and he's going to walk contrary to you in equal measure. And he will punish you yet seven times more for your sins. And I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. Well, I mean, look, this is what's going on right now. This is going on right now. We have 
we have a leadership that just doesn't get it. Oh, we're just going to continue on our wicked ways. You're being delivered into the hands of your enemies as we speak. Now, you may say to yourself, well, we don't have any enemy troops here in the United States yet. Oh, we, we most certainly do. We have enemy troops all over the United States. Why do you think the country is so divided? Why do you, and who do you think is behind this division? Who do you think is deploying troops to destroy those who love the Constitution? Who's deploying troops to those who still have a patriotic bone in their body? Who's destroying troops for those who call themselves against those who call themselves Americans and who love the Constitution? Who's doing that? Who's doing that? Is that what you would call a patriotic army? Absolutely not. You have a totally corrupted body, which is at war with the people that put them in power. Okay. Pride? Why stand you afar off, Uyawa? Why hide yourself in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be taken in the devices they have imagined. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire and blesses the covetous, whom Yahweh abhors. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after Elohim. Elohim is not at all in his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Your judgments, Yah, are far above out of his sight. As for all of his enemies, he puffs at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. He crouches and humbles himself that the poor may fall by his strong ones. He has said in his heart, El has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see it. Tehillim, Psalm 10, verses 1 through 11. The psalm continues. Arise, O Yahweh, O El, lift up your hand, forget not the humble. Wherefore does the wicked condemn Elohim? He has said in his heart, you will not require it. You have seen it, for behold, mischief and spite, the requite it with your hand. The poor commits himself unto you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness till you find none. Yahweh is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his land. Yahweh, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear, to judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may no longer oppress. Truly. Elohim is good to Yasharel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasses them about as a chain. Therefore, Pride compasses them about as a chain, and violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. Yet in Psalm 73, it reads, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of El. Then I understood their end. Surely you did set them in slippery places. You cast them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakens, so at a night when you awake. 
you shall despise their image. Mm. So this is the point I'm trying to make tonight. And I want to make it to not only the leaders in our country, those of those, those who are so compromised, they, you know, they, they worship at the, at the table of money. They don't want to hear uh, any kind of reciprocation or any kind of accountability for what they've done. Look, I got here this far. You shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm in control. I've got power. I've got money. I've got power and money. Therefore, I'm doing better in this world than you are because I have power and I have money. They don't realize they are completely impoverished and totally naked before a judging Yahweh who sees everything they have done. Now, if you're a person who has any sense of decency left in your body at any level, at any point, you need to consider that without repentance, your destruction comes at the hands of Yahweh. Your destruction comes. And not only will you be destroyed on this earth, but you will be destroyed in the kingdom to come. And when the Perashim saw it, they said into his Talmudim, why does your rabbi eat with publicans and sinners? But when Yahusha heard that, he said unto them, that they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Then he said to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O offspring of vipers, you know, or as we would call in the modern world, O you seed of Satan, you offspring of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? What are you doing here? Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that Elohim is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every, every tree, every tree, every tree, therefore, which brings not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the Torah of Moshe and in the prophets and in the Tehillim concerning me. Uh, they're very interesting because here you have Mashiach saying that scripture includes the Torah of Moshe, all of the prophets and the Tehillim, the praises. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved HaMashiach to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things, that repentance and remission of sins would come under the name of Yahusha the Mashiach. Yahusha, for repentance and remission of sins. There is no other remission of sin but through Yahusha. Remember that Yahusha HaMashiach of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my Besra, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of Elohim is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain salvation which is in Mashiach, Yahusha, with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abides faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before Yahweh that they strive not about words to no profit. Stop striving about words that have no profit in them, but work to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show yourself approved unto Elohim, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's from 2 Timothy 2, 8 through 15. And in these times, we see this. Know this also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, 
boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Oh, man, does this stuff sound familiar to you guys? What we've seen going on in the press in the United States in the last several years? Oh, yeah. False accusers without without any affection whatsoever. Truce breakers breaking every truce they ever made. Incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. They hate people that seek after righteousness. Traitors. Yeah, traitors. Traitors. That's what we have. When you have somebody who is allegiant to the World Economic Forum, they're a traitor to the United States. When you have someone who's picked up citizenship in another country after being born an American, they're traitors to the United States. When you have somebody who's representing the interests of the United Nations or who's representing the interests of papal Rome, they're traitors. They're heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of Elohim, having a form of holiness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women who are laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I got a lot of facts, but I don't have any truth. And what is truth, right? In the words of Pilate, Pilate. What is truth? Well, I mean, it's a question. What is truth, right? But Psalm 119, 142 says, my instruction, my Torah is truth. My instruction is truth. My Torah is truth. And Mashiach says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Thus says Yahusha, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yahusha, et daref, et emet, ve et chayim. The way, the truth. And the life. Now, as Yanis and Yambres withstood Moshe, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds. Who's resistant to the truth? Well, I don't want to hear the truth. Uh, sorry, I'm uh, 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 You're talking the truth. Yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. Don't talk to me. I'm not listening. I'm not. Uh, what? Why did they resist the truth? Because they have a corrupt mind. They're reprobate concerning the faith. They shall proceed no further. For their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. Well, guess what, guys? Guess what, you wicked ones in power? Your folly is now manifest unto all mankind. You know, you can sit here and tell yourself in the mirror you're doing a great job, but the pump says six bucks a gallon. You can sit here and tell yourself you're doing a great job, but the economy is in a negative growth mode. You can say you're doing a good job, but we're on the verge of World War III. You can say you're doing a good job. We've got food shortages all over the country. You can say you're doing a good job, but we have a drought breaking out all over the country. You can say you're doing a good job, but we have a society that's completely falling apart. You can say you're doing a good job, but we have never been more divided as a nation. What are you talking about? Good job. Talk to yourself in the mirror. Your folly is manifest to all mankind. We know who did it, and we know it's you, and it's because of your folly that it was done because you have a corrupt mind and a reprobate mind concerning the faith and you shall proceed no further yea and all that will live righteously in Mashiach Yahusha shall suffer persecution but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived in other words you're not going to get any better when you are an evil man and a seducer, you're not getting any better. You just kind of keep going. Yeah, well, that's a little bit worse. Yeah, that's a little bit worse. Yeah, that's a little bit worse. Until you are sickeningly worse. But what is the advice in 2 Timothy chapter 3? But continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them, and that from a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto Yeshua, salvation, through faith, which is in Yahusha HaMashiach. All scripture is given by the Ruach Elohim and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Righteousness, that the man of Elohim may be perfect, thoroughly, 
furnished unto all good works. Now, when we talk about instruction in righteousness, you know, in the Hebrew class that we do uh, during the week, which we're just about to wrap up, we had a long discussion about Torah, and we were discussing, in particular, the letter Tav. And the letter Tav has an implication, particularly in the law, because the letter Tav means you shall, right? As compared to the letter Aleph as a prefix means I will, Aleph, I will, the letter Tav means you shall. So when you see lo ta naaf, you shall not commit adultery, or you shall not break wedlock, right? Lo ta naaf. This is because the Tav infers as a prefix, you shall. But when you see the word Torah, Torah has a root word, yira, yira, which means to teach, to teach, to instruct, to teach. So Torah is you shall teach. You see, Torah, you shall instruct. Torah, you shall teach. So when Paul is talking about instruction for righteousness, he's talking about the Torah, Sedekah. The Torah, Sedekah. So you have the righteous Torah, right? The instruction in righteousness, that the man of Elohim may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. But knowing their thoughts, he said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought into desolation. And a house divided is uh, against the house false. A house divided against the house false. Now, I think, let me just stop this for just one second and look here. Because during this presentation, I was presenting, uh, oh yeah. Okay, yeah, let me come back to the share screen here just one second. All right, hold on here. Yeah, I was presenting when I was doing this, I thought I had the slide and I do have it, so I can go to it. That's good. Let's share that. All right, that's good. We'll pop this over here. Okay. So let's continue here in the in the Besara Matthew Yahu with the Gospel of Matthew. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him I will confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Well, okay. Now, just a couple of things. America is divided like no other time in history. Now, I didn't write that. Michael Cohen wrote that, and he wrote it for MSNBC. America's divide is sharper than ever this 4th of July. This was published by Michael Cohen on the 4th of July this year. And he says, quote, America is becoming two very different countries, a blue one and a red one with little in shared identity and vastly different health and economic outcomes. On this 4th of July, America is in even worse shape, more divided and more polarized, and there is little reason to expect that we will come together anytime soon. Americans no longer share the same creed. And I left the citation there for that word. But he's not the only one that said it. How about this? America is a nation divided among itself. How much longer can it stand? This was written by Steve McCann on July 5th this year. This was written for uh, lifesitenews.com. Okay, not since the decade leading up to the Civil War has there been as much discussion about the possibility of the United States splitting into two or more countries as there has been in the past 10 years. The reality is that this nation has effectively split into two countries, which are for the moment tenuously living side by side. And so he points this out. I'm going to take a few quotes from what Steve McCann said, and we can see this the, the level of division. So he says, one America is hell-bent on stripping its citizens of their inalienable right of self-defense, as codified in the Second Amendment as well as eliminating constitutionally protected freedom of speech. Their mindless determination to confiscate guns by any means possible, either overt or devious, and censor speech they do not approve is unbound, unrestrained, and regardless of 
court rulings. And by the way, there's been a recent study showing no correlation between the amount of firearms in the community and the rate of murder in the community. There's zero correlation. It has nothing to do with that. In fact, the correlation has to do with the mental mindset of the people, not the availability of firearms. The other America is firm and unmoving in the belief that unalienable and constitutional protected rights are non-negotiable and immutable. The unabashed attempt at disarmament has had the effect of convincing over half of the populace that these actions are a prelude to the government's willingness to use force against its own citizenry to strip them of all their rights. This, as 92% of Americans believe, that, at, uh, that all their basic rights are under siege. 92% of Americans believe that all their basic rights are under siege. One America is determined to protect the interests of the ruling elites by establishing an implacable two-tiered justice system. The ruling class and their militant bedfellows have created a judicial system wherein their allies, followers, and politically correct felons and criminals are treated leniently or in many cases not prosecuted at all, while their political adversaries and followers who pose a threat to their hegemony and non-politically correct felons and criminals are hounded and persecuted. Meanwhile, in the other America, the citizens adamantly believe in equal justice under the law, that they and all Americans have a constitutionally protected right to a fair and impartial justice system. Well over half of the citizenry is irrevocably convinced that there is a two-tier and unfair system of justice that benefits the ruling elites at their expense. This now intractable mindset has been reinforced by the treatment of nonviolent January 6th protesters as compared to the actions of the domestic terrorists in the summer of 2020, who did billions of dollars in damage and created criminal murders and assaults in the city of Portland, just as a single example. So he continues to write, and I think this is a very important discussion. These two countries, and again, this is uh, Steve McCann writing for lifesitenews.com, an opinion called America is a nation divided among itself. How much longer can it stand? These two countries within a country can no longer maintain their increasingly tenuous and potentially volatile relationship. We as a nation are at that defining moment when one side has to win and the other lose, there is no middle ground. The era of conservatives, libertarians, and middle of the road Americans seeking accommodation with the left and the ruling class has ended. Whether they want it to be or not, as more than half of the American citizenry agrees with the statement, quote, U.S. democracy is at risk of extinction, and only 26% believe it will survive. In order for America as founded to win without either side resorting to dissolution or potential violence, the lifelines of the ruling elites, radical left, must be severed and their political clout fully marginalized. Okay, now, so this is the writing of Steve McCann. And I think this is a very uh, brilliantly written article and, but he makes some points that, of course, I'm reluctant. I didn't want to get to these conclusions that we as a nation are at that defining moment when there is no middle ground. One side is going to win and the other side is going to lose. There is no middle ground. We cannot accommodate one another one uh, anymore. Democracy is at risk of extinction. Only 26 percent believe it will survive. Hmm. You know what that means? 74 percent believe it won't. It won't. OK. Yet for believers, the solution is twofold. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and Elohim has remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she has filled, fill her to double. How much she has glorified herself, lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and I shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death, mourning, famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is Yahweh Elohim who judges her. So the twofold solution for the believer, first, come out of her 
my people. Second, and Moshe went up to Elohim and Yahweh called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Yaakov and tell the children of Yasharel, You have seen what I did unto the Mitzrim and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and guard my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak unto the children of Yasharel. Second thing, obey his voice, guard his covenant. Then we will be a peculiar treasure, and we will come out on eagle's wings. And so Deuteronomy 28 is going to continue with these curses. But if you will not guard, if you will not guard to do all the words of this Torah, this instruction that are written in this Sefer, that you may fear this glorious and fearful name, Yahweh Elokeka. Right? You will guard the works of this Torah that are written in the Sefer, that you may fear the glorious and fearful name, Yahweh Elokeka. Then Yahweh will make your plagues wonderful, and at the plagues of your seed, even great plagues and of long continuance and sore sicknesses and of long continuance. Moreover, he will bring upon you at all the diseases of the Mitzrayim, which you were afraid of, and they shall cleave unto you. Also, every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the Sefer of this Torah, them will Yahweh bring upon you until you be destroyed. And ye shall be left few in number, whereas ye were as the stars of heaven for a multitude, because you would not obey the voice of Yahweh Eloheka. And it shall come to pass that as Yahweh rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so Yahweh will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to naught. And ye shall be plucked from off the land whither you go to possess it. And Yahweh shall scatter you among all people from one end of the earth, even unto the other. And there you shall serve other, other Elohim, which neither you nor your fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shall you find no ease, neither shall the sole of your foot have rest. But Yahweh shall give you there a trembling heart and a failing of eyes and a sorrow of mind. And your life shall hang in doubt before you and you shall fear day and night and you shall have no assurance of your life. Mm. A place I'd rather not be. So my question to you is, when do we turn? When do we turn? Okay, my friends. So now I would say it's time for some questions. Now it's time for some questions. All right. Let's see if we can get some questions here, and I'll try to... Uh, uh, I'll try to answer those questions as best I can, given the situation. And I want to thank you guys for being with me for tonight's presentation. You know, I want to make this point while we're preparing questions. You know, the point of this presentation is not to bring a gloom and doom, but to try to reach the people who are deceived and who are lost and who refuse to see what Yah is calling them to do. It is time, it is time, it is time, it is time for people to turn. It is time for this nation to turn. And our leaders, if they had any decency whatsoever. Look, when you've been excommunicated from your own church, which is giving you latitude to do all kinds of things, you need to rethink your position. What are you doing in power? What are you doing in power? You should be going home and retiring and leaving your seat and leave it for someone to Clean up the mess you have left. That's what it's going to take. Leave it to someone who can clean up the mess. Okay. Yeah, so be humble in the sight of Yahweh says, when do we turn? Do not even take the next breath for granted, let alone the time to think about repenting. Yeah, amen. So, so true in that. We have the breath that Yah and Yah alone has given us. The time is now. I agree. Okay. So let's see. 
Thank you, the test 247. Chris Aldridge, if the seven churches are destroyed and gone, how can they obtain blessing or curses? Yeah, that's a great question. You're talking about the seven churches of Revelation. And what happened is, is that although the seven churches are gone, remember that there were seven angels of those seven churches and seven lampstands. And in each one of those seven churches, the prophecy reads, if you do not hearken unto my words, I will remove this lampstand from its place and put it elsewhere. And that's where they have gone. Okay, so Lucky Owl asks, Stephen, what's going to happen on 7-11? Well, there's been a lot of discussion about these dates in July and so on and so forth. And in particular, that the United States was given 10 years to print money until July 4th, and then that came to an end. All of these are interesting numbers and so forth. But I can tell you that what you're seeing now is that they have no choice now. You have people that have gone recklessly down the road at 120 miles an hour. Now they've lost control of the vehicle. The vehicle is skidding sideways. We've got curves coming up. We have a very uh, bad curve with no guardrails and there is a thousand foot quick over the end and we're going and it's a 50 mile an hour curve and we're doing 120 and in a four wheel slide. So what do you think is gonna happen? And the only, the only chance we have at all is for the wicked to step aside and allow somebody who's seeking righteousness to begin to push the country back into righteousness. That's what's gonna have to happen. And if it doesn't happen, then the curses of Deuteronomy 28 are gonna manifest themselves. That's why that tablet was revealed because Yah is saying, these curses are upon you. Now, you might recall that Zedekiah didn't believe in the curses of Deuteronomy 28. And he didn't believe in what Jeremiah was telling him because Jeremiah was telling him, look, just capitulate to Babylon, go do it, relax, everything's gonna be fine. And he wouldn't do it. Instead, he made a deal with Ptolemy in Egypt and said, let's get together and fight this guy in Babylon, we'll beat him. And because with our two armies together, we can beat him. And when the Egyptians saw the Babylonian army and remembered how much money was taken out of Egypt by the house of Yasharel, they abandoned the field and they left Zedekiah to face Nebuchadnezzar alone. And Zedekiah then, only when the woman approached Zedekiah and said, you must help me, king, because I made a deal with this woman that because we were hungry, we would kill my son and eat him. And then when he was gone, we would kill her son and eat him. But we killed my son and ate him and then she took off and I can't find her. So I wanted you to enforce the contract. Only then did Zedekiah realize the curses of Deuteronomy 28 had come upon Yasharel completely, and they didn't miss a step. Only then did he realize it. Now, what I'm trying to tell the people that are in leadership right now, you guys have brought us to this same cursing. You brought us to the same cursing because of your wickedness. Now step aside and let righteous people lead. Okay, so Carolyn says, do you think the financial reset will happen by the end of this year, 2022? Will they use crypto? No, crypto is going to fail, Carolyn, and it's going to fail just for the same reason that the fiat currency is failing. There is nothing behind it. So they can come up with their CBDCs all they want, their cryptocurrencies, that their G7. This is, you know, seven idiots, you want my opinion. The G7, they can't manage their way out of a wet paper bag. But Boris Johnson knows that. That's why he suggested everybody go shirtless to show Putin how tough they are. And of course, the leader of the EU, who's a woman, said, well, we're not going there. And now Boris Johnson's out of power. These G, these G7 leaders are complete idiots. If they knew what they were doing, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in right now. They don't know what they're doing. They think they're going to go to a CBDC and they're going to control the currency and everybody's going to have a microchip and everybody's going to own nothing and be happy. Everybody's going to be on an ant farm and they're going to catch the train to work and everybody's going to work happily ever after as a slave under some system governed by elite idiots like Klaus Schwab who want to go and run in some neo-Nazism. Let me tell you this Nazism that is coming down in the United States. And whenever you have a corporate governance, any corporate board that is enforcing a mask mandate after the masks have been proven to be completely inefficacious is a Nazi organization in, in, imposing Nazi medical fascism under their Nazi arrogance. That's who they are. They should just run a swastika up on their corporate logo because that's who they are, Nazis. And so when you talk about the, the uh, no, the corporate re the, the reset, currency reset, no, no. No, there's the, the financial reset. That's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is we're going to continue on the course we are. The euro is going to completely plunge. The EU is probably going to break up. There is going to be a push out of the UK to try to rejoin some reformation of the EU, which won't be a reformation of the EU at all. It's going to be a try to, they're going to try to reclaim the Western Roman Empire. The mater nostrum was the language Boris Johnson and Emmanuel Macron used. They're going to try to reform the Roman Empire to include all of Northern Africa. 
And what's going to take place instead is going to be a major war between Turkey, Syria, Greece, Iran, Israel. That thing is going to go completely. That thing is just going to blast into, you know, a practical, it's going to be an unbridled fist fight between a whole bunch of groups that are going to just beat, be beaten up on each other. It's going to be ruthless and brutal. And Russia is going to be in the middle of that. And the war in Europe is not going to be a war at all. What's going to take place is Russia is going to tell Europe, you want to come in and, and uh, try it, a war with Russia? Come on down. We'll take you on in the field until there's nothing of you left, which they've already done in Ukraine, by the way. Ukraine is now drafting women because their army has been completely slaughtered. And so what's going to take place is Europe is going to try to say, well, we're going to put all these people in. There. Well, go for it. End of the day, when Europe goes completely bankrupt, Every nation flat on its face, no food, no gas, no oil, no industry, no manufacturing, and no government. Then Russia is going to say, hey, guess what? I guess we're the ones going to be making the decisions now because you don't have anybody that can. And it's because the leaders will not smell the coffee right now. You need to smell the coffee right now and do the right thing and stop doing the wrong thing. That's the first rule of leadership. Do the right thing and stop doing the wrong thing. So do not worry about the currency at all. Okay. All right. So let's see. Um, okay. Hold on. I don't know why I, I lose this so quickly. Um, let's see. I'm glad to be doing this study. Let's see what we've got here. Um, do you think it's worth keeping gold coins on hand? Well, you know, look, gold, silver, you know, brass, lead, right? Uh, those things are always interesting, precious metals. You know, the truth is you need to have, you need to invest in yourself and in terms of your network for surviving. In other words, you want to have food that's going to be around, fresh water that's going to be around and a livable, uh, mahalo, Dave, thank you. I appreciate that. You need to have these kinds of things around you if you're going to survive. And you need to have those more than you need to have gold and silver, okay? Okay, all right, let's see what we have. Mount Vesuvius erupted. Yeah, yeah. Bethany says, man, Mount Vesuvius erupted August 24th, 73 AD as a judgment on the leadership that had taken place in the destruction of the temple in Israel, right? Okay, Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, Solomon, or decimation only from within the Asherah. No, no. I mean, it could be speaking of Solomon. I don't think so. I mean, more likely, Isaiah 14 is speaking of Nebuchadnezzar more than Solomon. And and when you talk about Ezekiel 28, it's very interesting that the, the angel described there as being covered with jewels has the same jewels that are that are found on the horse that took Muhammad to heaven called Al-Barak, Al-Barak, that horse, yeah, has those same jewels. Okay. Yeah, no more cursing stones, probably a good place to start. Yeah, the Georgia Guidestones. Well, the Georgia Guidestones, you know, as you know. It was very interesting because it, apparently I thought they were blown up by lightning, but I was wrong. It looks like there was an explosion of some sort. And those guide stones, when they blew them up, uh, you know, I mean, somebody could have come in and said, okay, well, let's put a fence around this, block the public from getting to it, and then we'll repair it. But that's not what happened. The county went out there with a backhoe and knocked the whole thing down. So this thing is, uh, you know, it's uh, too at risk. It's uh, unsafe. We have to take this down. Well, now it's gone. And uh, so we'll see what that means, right? Okay, let's see what else we have here. Okay, all right. Okay, well, what's very interesting. Okay, so we've had a good set of questions here tonight. So I'm gonna thank you guys for hanging with me tonight in tonight's presentation. And we will see you again next week. And for those of you who are in the Sabbath study, we'll see you on Saturday for the Sabbath study. And remember that coming up, not starting this coming Wednesday, but next Wednesday, we are going to be studying the 10 Devarim at Sefer Academy. If you want to join that class, it's a good opportunity. The piano from scratch is going to be also, be, we're going to be getting to make that available next week. And that is going to be a non-participatory class. So you can look at the video, see what the instruction is, practice it, look at it again, see it again, look at it again, look at it again until you get it. And then you'll find that there'll be another video up that you can learn the next step. Until very soon, you'll be playing all of your, your favorite praise music in every possible key. Yes, yes, I'm going to teach you all those things. You can do it. You can do it. Okay, guys. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. I appreciate that. Thank you again, Kimberly. I appreciate it. Thank you, Valerie. I appreciate it. And Laura Lee, thank you so much. And we will see you guys next week. Okay, thanks. And shalom. Bahashem Yavshem. Amen.